Parandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanye Na Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschachadeshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaihebacha Patita Nam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadhadhar Shri Vasadegor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so we welcome everyone to our study of Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav and we are going over the fifth canto section on Vedic cosmology. So this evening we are going to look at chapter number 20, uh, 24 I think it is, uh, Sishumara. Alright, let me see. 23, Maharaj. 23, is it? Sorry. Uh, okay. 23. Yeah. 20. Oh, 24 is subterranean, right? That's a subterranean. Right. We have three chapters still remaining after this one. This chapter number 23, the Sishumara planetary systems. Sishumara meaning dolphin, right? Dolphins, playful creatures. So, the stars, the formation of the stars in the sky, remember, resemble a dolphin. Uh, anyway, this is chapter 23. We still have chapter 24. We'll hear about the subterranean heavenly planets, say, uh, Bila Swarga. And then we'll hear also chapter 25 about the glories of Lord Ananta, Ananta Shesha, who is holding up the Bhumandala. And then final chapter is about the hellish planets, which is the introduction for, chap for Canto 6. And then Sukadeva Goswami can narrate the, past, the story of Ajamila. All right, so today we're going to look at this chapter 23, Sishumara Planetary Systems. Uh, wait, I do have a, power, have a PowerPoint here. Chapters 23 and 24. Are you all able to see this? Yes, my Okay, good. All right, so this chapters, we've delineated three sections actually it should be more right okay 
Okay, chapter overview. This chapter describes how all the planetary systems take shelter of the pole star, Dhruva Loka. It also describes the totality of these planetary systems to be Sishumara, another expansion of the external body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All right, so the first three verses will describe the glories of Dhruva Loka, the pole star. Dhruva Loka, the residence of Mahavish, um, Shiru Dakshai Vishnu. And Dhruva Maharaj resides there. And he's glorified, Prabhupada said, Krishna, the Lord glorified, he wanted to see his pure devotee, Dhruva Maharaj, glorified. So he gave him residence there and he put him in charge of directing all the planets as they revolve, as they rotate in the universe. And Dhruva Maharaj will reside there for one kalpa, kalpa meaning one day of Lord Brahma's life. So Dhruva Maharaj is there, maybe at the end of uh, the life of that one day of Brahma, Dhruva Maharaj may go on to Vaikuntha, he may go on to the Maha, into the spiritual world, to Vaikuntha. He won't go to Goloka. He's not really a Krishna Bhakta. <laughs> Sorry, Maharaj. Yeah, okay. So Dhruva Maharaj, of course, when he was doing his meditation, he was greeted by uh, Lord Vishnu came to see him on the back of Garuda. So Dhruva Maharaj is going to go to Vaikuntha, he's a Vaikuntha Vasi. But he's a great devotee, right? At the same time, he's not as great as Prahlad. We heard earlier that it was described how Dhruva Maharaj was a, a Sakama Bhakta, who be, he became Akama by the grace of the Lord. With a little pushing from the Lord, he gave up his material desires, lost his material desires. But Prahlad Maharaj never had that problem. He never had material desires. But doesn't take away the fact that Dhruva Maharaj is a very great devotee. And that fact is shown by the fact that the, the Saptarishis, they all offer obeisances to him and offer respect to him. And all the planets in the universe, all these, they're all different personalities in charge of these different planets. They're all rotating, they're all circumambulating the planet where Dhruva Maharaj is residing. Of course, the Lord is also there, so we could say, well, they're offering their respect to the Lord, but at the same time, they're also offering their respects to Dhruva Maharaj, because Dhruva Maharaj is residing there, and he's the one actually in charge of the motions of the planets. So they get definitely offer their respects to Dhruva Maharaj. So the pole star is described as being an eternal planet. So what happens at the time of annihilation? Does anybody know? At the end of the life of Brahma, there will be a total annihilation. What will happen to Dhruva Loka? Yes? Anybody? Please? Correct. Nothing will happen to Dhruva Really? It will remain just as it is? Yes, sir. Well, everything else is being annihilated. Every, it's the time of death, it's the end of the life of Brahma, and even the topmost planets, even Satyaloka and everything, they're all going to come to an end. 
Sorry, everything else will go to the Lord Vishnu. And what? what but what about Dhruva Loka? What's going to happen it, to it? Till Dhruva Loka, it remains as is. After Dhruva Loka, everything will be annihilated, according to my understanding, Maharaj. Well, Jiva Goswami explains. He says the external features of Dhruva Loka will be destroyed, but the internal features of Dhruva Loka will become invisible, will become invisible until the next manifestation of Brahma. Thank you, Madhya. That's explained by Jiva Goswami and his Sandarbhas. So Dhruva Loka, very important planet and also called, what's some other names for Dhruva Loka? Pole star. Sorry, what? Pole star, yes. Another name? Shwetadipa. Sorry? Shwetadipa. Shwetadweep, yes. Another name? Many names. All right. Anyway, many names for the Dhruva Loka, for the pole star, Svetadri, because Shirudakashai Vishnu is there, his residence is there, the milk ocean. Okay, so that's the first three verses of this chapter. And then it goes on to, we have descriptions of the body of the Sishumara dolphin. And then mantra to worship Sishumara and the result of that worship. This section is spoken for a special class of people who are there in the assembly of Sukadeva Goswami hearing Srimad Bhagavatam who are not bhakt, not really devotees, they're more yogis, mystic yogis, and they're more inclined to meditation on the universal form, on the virata rup. And of course you've already had, described. this has been described for us already in the second chapter, and then later on in chapter, next chapter 24, at the end of chapter 24, they also describe the benefits of meditating on the Virata Rup and how meditation on that Virata Rup actually uh, liberates one from the material existence, dis destroys all sins and brings one to the platform of liberation. So meditation on this uh, Sishumara Sishu form is being described not particularly for devotees, but for these yogis who just want to sit and meditate on the form of the Lord. For the devotees, we will meditate on, what, what will we meditate on? What do you like to meditate on? Krishna, not Krishna. How do you meditate on Krishna? Where? What? Where is, does he come and sit with you, in front of you? Krishna Yes. On the beach. Huh? We chant on the beach and meditate on Rasha Krishna. All right. You chant on the beach, you meditate on the holy name. Yes. Any other way you can you can meditate on Krishna? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, by, by hearing uh, the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Okay, by hearing the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Yes. And for the eyes? By uh, Hare Krishna. Remembering the form of Krishna. 
by taking the darshan of the deities. Yes, right. By doing our service. We have to see the deities, right? It's very important for us. It's such a great opportunity to go and see the form of the Lord in his deity, incarnation. It's not just some statue which we go and worship, but this is the Lord actually incarnate, he's actually incarnating in the form of the deity. And we have to understand when we go to see the Lord how fortunate, what a blessing it is. And how fortunate are the devotees who are personally serving the deities. Worshipping the deities is so wonderful, so important to be able to take part in deity worship. Everyone should do some deity worship. Everyone from time to time should offer arti. Sometimes we get devotees, you know, they've studied so many things and, and they, they, they don't know how to offer arti. Sometimes we get devotees, you know, they're, in, they're doing Bhakti Vaibhava and they even go on to Bhakti Vedanta and like that. But sometimes they don't know basic things like, you know, ask, ask them to lead the Tosi Arti and they say, oh, oh, give me a songbook. <laughs> you know, they say, give me a songbook. I say, what? Tosi Arti? We sing it every day. <laughs> but, you know, not everybody does it every day. We're supposed to. So sometimes the basic things people don't know. I was in the temple, in Kalkara temple one time, this was in Prabhupada's time, Prabhupada came there. And Prabhupada came and there was one man came and he was talking to Prabhupada. So Prabhupada asked the man to become a life member. So the man said, okay, I'll become a life member. So Prabhupada called the temple president in temple president was a, an American devotee at that time and Prabhupada told him, make, make this man a life member. <laughs> so the, the, the devotee who was the temple president, he came out and said, he said to me, he said, what do I have to do? He said, I don't know. I don't know how to make a life member. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know, our whole temple was being supported by life membership. But the devotee who was running the temple, he didn't know personally how to make a life member. <laughs> so sometimes we miss the most basic things in our Krishna consciousness. Anyway, here's a very important, very nice actually, description of all the different stars in the constellation and how they represent this form of the dolphin. And is described for us and the benefits of worship, how to worship and the benefit you get from worshipping. So everything is explained here. Let's read from these verses. Okay. First of all, above the Saptarishis is Druvaloka, right? Druvaloka, the top of the well, not exactly the top of the universe, but it's above the Saptarishis, right? <laughs> There's so many other things above Dhruvaloka. We saw in the diagram, right? You go above Dhruvaloka, then you come to Janaloka, Mahaloka, Tapaloka, Satyaloka, and then you go on, and then there's the, the coverings of the universe and so on. Anyway, above the Saptarishis, is Dhruvaloka, 1.3 million yojanas above the planet of the seven sages in the is the abode of Lord Vishnu, where Dhruva remains until the end of the Kalpa. I was not sure, I forgot what a Kalpa was, I had to look it up to make sure. Anyway, it's a day of Brahma. <laughs> so many different terms which are used. One day of Brahma, Kalpa. There are different kalpas, right? And sometimes the Lord incarnates, just like Varaha incarnates different colors in different kalpas. So some, some incarnations, they appear in every, uh, every millennium, uh, every, every, and some people, some incarnations come in every kalpa. So circumambulating him are Agni, Indra, 
prajapati kashyapa and dharma with respect so such great sages demigods indra the king of the demigods agni very powerful god god of fire prajapati kashyapa the husband of aditi dharma they're all giving respect to dhruva maharaj it's very significant the pole star is the pivot of all luminaries this star established by the lord is the central pivot of all the stars and planets the unsleeping that's an interesting description unsleeping just like we were talking about the sun god and devotee was worried that you know doesn't he need some rest does he keep going mounting the wheel of time he's always working he never stops so here also the the pole star is described unsleeping invisible most powerful time factor causes these luminaries to revolve around the pole star without cessation so it's the time factor which is invisible and unsleeping time never stops unfortunately and we often find time it goes of course it goes faster as we get older i'm always amazed at how fast the time goes when i was young i was always thinking what well, takes so long time goes so slow but now in my old age i can feel how quick the time goes but at the same time it's just the impressions change so unsleeping invisible most powerful most powerful that nobody can conquer time prabhupad was fond of quoting chanakya that uh, time is more valuable than gold and in in china also they have a they have that saying also about time they say you can buy an inch of gold but you cannot buy an inch of time so time very powerful and uh, nobody has it, it's it's under the direction of krishna right it's under the control of the supreme lord it's his manifestation we we say also time moves like an arrow moves very fast like an if you watch someone firing arrows you don't see the arrow go you only hear it hit the target so time is a bit like that it goes very fast and hits very hard so most powerful time factor causes these luminaries to revolve around the pole star without cessation so the luminaries are moving around the pole star and at the same the luminaries move under the influence of the time factor but they also have their own motion as well so it's not just only that they're moving around with the time factor like we heard the potter's wheel so the ants on the potter's wheel the ants also have their own motion although they're on the wheel and they're moving with the wheel they have their own independent motion and the same is true with the planets the different luminaries they also have their own motion although they're also moved influenced by the the time factor which causes them to rotate and we see the sun planet for example it has vertical motion it has also horizontal motion it's not only vertical motion it's moving different ways so the, each of the planets they're rotating around the pole star but then they have their own independent motions also and that's why we have such a evolution in the history of the world so many things change constantly so the third verse 
A very important verse, very extensive purport is given, Prabhupada talking about the pole star. How do the planets and stars rotate around the pole star? And the example was given, just as bulls yoked together and tied to a central post to thresh rice, tread around the pivot without deviating from their proper positions. So all the planets and luminaries fixed in the zodiac revolve around the pole star in their respective orbits, higher and lower, all until till the end of the kalpa propelled by wind. So this cosmic or myst mystical wind is there. We heard about Dhruva Maharaj with his ropes on the sun and the ropes were actually wind which is used to raise and lower the position of the sun as the sun rotates. So here also all the planets and stars they're rotating due to this cosmic wind. Uh, how do they remain in orbit? And then we're given very interesting examples by Srila Prabhupada. He said, he gives two examples in his purport about how they remain in orbit. One is the cloud, and he said one cloud can, carry, can be carrying a huge weight of water in the cloud, just like now with the monsoon coming, there's so many clouds, dark blue clouds, and they're carrying a lot of water in them. But who's holding these clouds in space? How do they manage to stay, to float in the space? This is the inconceivable potency of the Supreme Lord, the creator behind this manifestation, that he can create these big, huge bags carrying so much water, and they don't fall down, but they stay up there floating in, in the sky. That's one example. And then the other example is this big bird. What, what kind of eagle is it again? The Cheyenne, Cheyenne eagle, which is like a huge bird and they can fly from one planet to another. And Srila Prabhupada gives the example, he said sometimes they will pick up an elephant, and these birds are so big and powerful, they will pick up the elephant, fly up in the sky with the elephant, and then drop it from a height so that the elephant dies. Then they will come and eat the elephant. So, and he said even there are birds, there are smaller birds who will pick up monkeys. They'll t pick up monkeys and fly up in the air with them and then drop them from the sky and, let them be, and smash them on the ground and then they can come and eat the monkey. That's one way they, these birds get their food. And so he said, how do these birds manage to fly in the sky? They're so big. He said, it's the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. It's all going on under his arrangement, that he holds everything under his grip. Materialistic scientists call it the force of gravity. But Srila Prabhupada said, it's simply due to Krishna. It's all done by his potency. Oh, 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 oh. What happened? Okay, we said, just as the clouds are egos controlled by the wind and pushed by karma, move about in the sky, so the planets supported by matter and the Lord and moving by their past karmas do not fall to the ground. And so these birds and the clouds, they don't fall to the ground, but the monkeys <laughs> and the elephants which are picked up, they fall to the ground. 
So everyone has their own karma. And some people have good karma, some not so good. All right, so that the discussion on the pole star, and then moving on to the description of the Sishumara dolphin. Some describe the zodiac belt, the great machine consisting of the stars and planets to have the form of a dolphin, Sishumara, and for worshipping Vasudeva in meditation. And so then we're given descriptions about how, how we should visualize this dolphin. Hmm? Right? The, the tail is up, because the tail is up at the planet of Dhruva. So it has its head downwards and the tail up, the body, its body coiled. So the end of the tail is the planet of Dhruva, and the body of the tail is at the planet of the great sages below Dhruva Loka. And then the base of the tail, we're called about a couple of planets, never heard this before, but planets of Data and Vidata. I don't know where these planets are, didn't hear of them before. And then the hips of the dolphin are like the Saptarishis, like Vashishta and Angira. The right side of its coiled body are the 14 constellations from Abhijit to Punar, Punarvasu. And then the left side of its coiled body are the other 14 stars, Pushya, to Ut Uttara Saga. And then the back, back is like the group of stars known as Ajavita, Ajaviti, and the abdomen, the Ganges that flows in the sky. The Ganges that flows in the sky. We, it's called the Milky Way, right? The Ganges which flows in the sky. We heard about the Ganga coming in through, through the hole in the covering of the universe and then coming down first to Dhruvaloka and then to the Saptarishis and then to the moon planet and then on to Mount Meru. And from Mount Meru then it falls down into the Himalayas, onto the head of Lord Shiva, and then into the salt, salt water ocean. So in the, in the sky, this, uh, the Ganges is compared to the abdomen of this dolphin. Big dolphin. And here you can see very detailed description is given, all the different limbs, different parts of the do dolphin, they're all compared to different planets. So you can, you could really, you can really get into the meditation, you know, if you can, you have to memorize all of these things and think of all these different parts. So the 28 locations are located. on either side of the body of the dolphin. And we see right and left loin, right and left feet, right and left nostrils, right and left eyes, right and left ears, right ribs on the left side, ribs on the right side, right and left shoulders, upper chin, lower chin, mouth, genitals, back of its neck, chest, core of heart, mind, navel, breast, light air, neck, all over its body, pores. So 28 different constellations. <laughs> Very detailed description. 
I don't quite know how they manage to de decide which part, which part of the body is what. But anyway, it did a very good job, detailed job. The sun planet is described as the chest of the Lord. Lord Narayan is the core of his heart. That's reasonable. The moon is the mind. All right, that's also reasonable. We know about that. What a relationship between the mind and the moon. Other ones, not so clear. Rahu is the neck. Resco Rahu. All over the body, the comets and pores, numerous stars. Okay, so this is a very detailed description there. Okay, they don't talk about the, let's go to the text. So the benefits of worshipping and the system of worshipping is described. We want to look at text number four. The great machine consisting of the stars and planets resemble the form of a sisumara, right? Okay, we read all these different things. all the different limbs of the body, of the dolphin. Okay, text number eight, we have the, the mantra for worshipping the Sishumara. My dear king, the body of the Sishumara, as thus described, should be considered the external form of Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. External. In other words, it's a material form. It's not spiritual. It's extern the external. It's the external energy of the Lord. All the different stars and planets and comets all combine together to make this form of the Lord. So, morning, noon, and evening, one should one should silently observe the form of the Lord as the Sishumara Chakra and worship him with this mantra. And we're given the mantra, O Lord, who have assumed the form of time, O resting place of all the planets moving in different orbits, O master of all demigods, O supreme person, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you and meditate upon you. So it's a very personal prayer. You can understand that in the prayer they're recognizing the form of the Lord as the supreme above all the demigods. And so it's interesting that they, they recognize and they're worshiping the Lord as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, above all others. Of course, they describe him as the form of time. That's one form of the Lord, but that's their limited realization of the Lord. 
And that's, that's, that's the mantra, that's how they worship the Lord, with this prayer, morning, noon and evening, like their Gayatri mantra. So then Sukadeva Goswami comments on it, he talks about the body of the Supreme Lord, the resting place of all the demigods and all the stars and planets, one who chants this mantra to worship that Supreme Person three times a day, morning, noon and evening, will surely be freed from all sinful reactions if one simply offers his obeisances to this form or remembers this form three times a day all his recent sinful activities will be destroyed. So that's the blessing of worshipping the Sishumara. You destroy all sinful activities. Not all, just recent sinful activities. Okay, it's a very nice, not, not a very difficult thing to do, quite simple thing to do. Worship the Lord, remember the Lord three times a day. Of course, we're, we're already doing that when we chant Gayatri Mantra three times a day. It's a meditation on the Supreme Form of the Lord. We chant the Gayatri Mantra to remember the Lord and to offer our respects to Him. All right, then there's a lot of figures in the purport, a lot of dimensions are given all in yojanas, millions, hundreds and thousands of yojanas. I'll just read a little bit from the purport here, it talks about the Virata Rup, summarizing the entire description of the plenary system of the universe. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says that one who is able to meditate upon this arrangement of the Virata Rup or Vishwa Rup the external body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and worship Him three times a day by meditation will always be freed from all sinful reaction. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur estimates that Dhruva Loka, the pole star, is 3,800,000 yojanas above the sun. Above Dhruva Loka, by 10,000 yojanas is Maharloka. Above Maharloka by 20,000 yojanas is Janaloka. And above Janaloka by 80,000 yojanas is Tapaloka. And above Tapaloka by 120 million yojanas is Satya -yo Satyaloka. Thus the distance from the sun to Satyaloka is 233,800,000 yojanas or 1,870,400,000 miles. My goodness, these are big figures you can see. We're talking about going right up, up to the covering of the universe. The Vaikuntha planets begin 26,200,000 yojanas, which is 209,600,000 600, miles above Satyaloka. That's just above Satyaloka. <laughs> Thus, the Vishnu Purana describes that the covering of the universe is 260 million yojanas away from the sun. The distance from the sun to the earth is 100,000 yojanas and below the earth by 70,000 yojanas are the seven lower planetary systems called Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Rasatala and Patala. Below these lower planets by 30,000 yojanas, Sheshanaga is laying on the Garbodak ocean that ocean is 249,800,000 yojanas deep. Thus the total diameter of the universe is approximately 500 million yojanas or 4 billion miles. 
Okay, so that's the end of that chapter. What I thought we might do now for the rest of the class, I wanted that you could, you know, Srila Prabhupada said how he wanted that we should be able to explain about the passing of day and night and we should explain about the, the phases of the moon and the seasons and also uh, one other, like eclipses. So I thought we'll make some groups and you can each, each group can work on one of these things and make a presentation from what has been covered in this section of the Bhagavatam and what you understand, right? So how many people do we have here today, tonight, in the class? Uh, Maharaj, we have uh, 16 people, Maharaj. Oh, 16 people, okay, so four groups of four, <coughs> right? And yeah. the first group will deal with the question of day and night and how it's arranged, how day and night uh, is arranged in the, within the universe. And the second group will deal with the, the seasons and how the different seasons appear. The third group will be concerned with the waxing and waning of the moon, the faces of the moon. And the fourth group will explain something about eclipses. All right, so you, you make four groups. Oh, okay, Maharaj. Hmm? Uh -huh. How much time do we have, Maharaj? Well, like 15 minutes. Okay, Maharaj. Okay, I'll divide them into four groups. Uh -huh. I will, I'll, I'll divide the group into four and I will assign them, Maharaj. Yes, please. Thank you.
Maharaj? Yes. Due to some confusion, we have to refer back previous chapters, no Maharaj? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you.
Okay, Prabhu, I think uh, you could close the rooms. Jai Govinda Prabhu. Okay, is everyone back? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, good. All right, so c let's hear from group number one about day and night and how it happens within the universe. Who is this? Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Mataji. Have you been given to speak on the days and night? I'll just try. Mm whatever I can, because we couldn't actually complete uh, our discussion, but I'll try what we have uh, discussed, Maharaj. Okay, please. Maharaj, uh, the sun, in this chapter, in the starting, the summary tells that sun is not stationary and it is moving like any other planet. The movement of uh, sun determines the duration of day and night. When the sun travels north of the equator, it moves during the day and very quickly at night, thus increasing the duration of day and decreasing the duration of night. Then going to verse number three, um, uh, verse number Wh which chap Which chapter are you in? Uh, 21st chapter, Maharaj. Okay. And then going to the verse number four, he tells that when the sun passes through Mesha to Tula, the duration of the day and night are equal. But when it comes to the second sign, that is Vrishabha, it slowly, the duration of day increases till it comes to Cancer. And then it gradually decreases by half an hour till it comes to Tula. Then it becomes, day and night becomes equal. Then when it comes to the next uh, Rashi, that is Prishchika Rashi, or the Scorpio, the duration of the days decreases till it goes to Capricorn, and then it actually increases month after month till it comes to Mesha, where again the day and night becomes equal. So is, is this going to happen throughout the year, every day? Or is this a particular seasonal thing? Yeah, it is um, seasonal, Maharaj. Yes, I think it would be seasonal, yes. Yeah, I think you're, you're going into the seasons there. I was, you know, I think we want to be concerned first, in the, you know, in the, just with the, the nature of the day and the night and the sunrise and the sunset, sunrise and the midday sunset and then midnight, like that. Would somebody else, does anybody else have any thoughts on this? 
number seven, it is there, no? Sunrise, moon, rise, sunset. Uh-huh. Hmm. Yes, we spoke about, remember, uh, the sun god's chariot going round Manasatara mountain on Pushkara Dweep, in the middle of Pushkara Dweep, going around Pushkara Dweep in the form of a ring is the Manasatara mountain and the sun god rises chariot. The axle was fixed to mount, from Mount Meru to the top of the, on top of the Manasatara mountain. And the wheel was, that one wheel was on the Manasatara mountain and the other axle was attached to Mount Meru, the summit of Meru. And it said that as he goes around, then that's a, the formation that brings about the changes from the day to night. There's, there's a four residences of four different demigods there. And he begins from the, one of the residences and, and he goes around and as he goes around then the sun, the sun is rising and then he comes back and then it comes to the sunset. That was one description of the passing of day and night. Right? Yes, Maharaj. Anyone else has any thoughts on this? The changing time, changing time? Yes, can I try, Maharaj? Please, Prabhu, yeah? Yeah, Maharaj, in the uh, 20 chap uh, 21st chapter, verse number 8 and 9, uh, it's described like uh, the people on uh, Mount Sumeru experience midday always, although the sun moves anti-clockwise, relative to the constellation with Mount Sumeru on its left, it also moves clockwise, being influenced by the Dakshina Varta wind. So again, uh, in the same verse, Maharaj, it also says uh, the sun rises in one city while it sets at the city which is diametrically opposite. When it shines at noon, it is midnight at the, the, at the city which is diametrically opposite. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Right. In the next verse, Maharaj, in the 10th verse, uh, it is given uh, uh, when the sun travels to Deva Dhani, to Samya Mini, uh, it travels, uh, the speed is given, hmm, mm -hmm. which is uh, in 15 Gatikas or 6 hours. Hmm? Yes. So it travels around 95.1 million Yojanas. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's how I would understand the passing of day and night, that as the sun god is moving around in his chariot, the, the, what is diametrically opposite that's in the darkness. It's where the sun god is, that's the light, and di the diametrically opposite place is in darkness. And the place, the place which he leaves, that's going to be the sun setting. And the place which he's going to, there will be the sun rising. But where he is, that will be the midday. So the sun god is going around, he goes around. So the sun brings, just like we said, Mount Meru is always in, it's always hot there, it's always in the full, full uh, rays of the sun. Because directly under the sun planet. The sun is in the center of the universe. On the, on the vertical scale, it's central in the universe. Mount Meru is in the center of the universe on the horizontal plane. 
and the sun is in the center of the universe on the vertical plane. So the sun is always overhead on Mount Meru, people on top of Mount Meru, they're always enjoying the heat. But what's being described was uh, the, outer, the outer island, which is Pushkaradweep, and um, Pushkaradweep is that Manasatara mountain, and the sun god's chariot goes around that. It's the biggest, it's the outermost island of the seven islands, it's the outermost island, and the sun god goes around there. So where he goes, the sun rises, then he comes to, as he, as he comes around, the sun is, as he goes, after he leaves the place, then the sun will set. And as he's coming to the place, the sun is rising, and when he gets there, then it will be full sun. And then when he leaves, then the sun will set. And then when he's di diametrically opposite that place, the place where he is will be midday, and the place diametrically opposite will be midnight. So that was the understanding of how, uh, how that's how I took the passing of day and night anyway how it was explained in this section of the Bhagavatam. Anybody, any, Ramakrishna Prabhu, what do you think? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I'm in line with uh, your thought. It's uh, definitely the, the, the sun god in his chariot, he's moving around the Manasatara mountains. And uh, as he moves, he radiates the effulgence. And that's how the day, night, and the midday, or the rising and the sun, the setting of the sun is seen. I think that understanding is quite clear, Maharaj. Okay. And the interesting part is also that when when the winds controlled by Dhruva pulls them, then when he moves on the vertical position, then uh, literally the the day and the night becomes longer or shorter for the other circles. So that's also another thing by which we can see the seasons changing. Right, that's right. That's that's the change of the seasons, yeah. All right, that's the second part. Number two, that's the second group, but the change of seasons. Who's going to present that? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance. Hare Krishna. My, myself and Nand Kishore Prabhupada will try to share something. Okay, good. The, about these seasons, it's, it's actually, it, it's, it's uh, this day and night and the seasons, this uh, eclipse and all, they actually depend on the movement of the uh, sun, which is actually known as a Suryanaya, is the most important planet. And uh, in uh, chapter 21, Maharaj, 521 and 13, shloka number 13, some description of the sun movement is given says that the, uh, the chariot of the sun god has only one wheel, which is known as Samvartha, which has like 12, like 12 months I calculated to be the 12 spokes. And the six seasons are the section of its rim. And the three Jatur Matsa period are as three sections hub. So this is how the seasons are divided March. There are six seasons. And there are three Chatur Mahasit. It all depends on the movement of the sun, Surya and Iron Mount. And the Kishore Prabhu, 520. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisance and my God glories to Slav Prabhu. So, Guru Maharaj, in the 22nd chapter, it briefly describes that how it is the movement of the sun. Uh, through the zodiac signs which is causing the seasonal changes. So there are 12 zodiac signs, like there are 12 Rashis and uh, depending on the name of the Rashi, uh, the name of the sign is there and uh, uh, like for the moon, every month is divided into two fortnights. So as per the solar calculation, uh, one month is the time that the sun spends for one constellation. 
and when such two months are spent it becomes one seasonal change so therefore uh, in 12 months there are uh, six seasons and uh, it also says about the entire sky being divided into two halves and uh, it is each half is the course uh, traversed by the sun in a period of six months so it it travels at different speeds during this travel sometimes it's moderate sometimes it's slow and uh, uh, in this way uh, the seasonal changes are happening uh, yes man this is what we understood basically that um, passing through the zodiac signs every two signs is a season and that's how the six seasons come forth okay thank you Yes, uh, we we also learned about as you mentioned the vertical motion of the sun also has some part to play there. What is called the Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. That's going to affect the the seasonal influences. Can you explain why, Nanda Kishore? You understand this? The rising and setting of the sun, as the sun goes up, it goes to the north, and as the sun goes to the south, how it affects us, what effect it has? Remember we showed the diagram, the sun, Dhruva Maharaj is pulling on his ropes. Yes, when he's loosening it, it goes a bit faster, and otherwise it's going on a slower speed. Right. Yeah. Why? Do you know why? Why it's going faster? Uh, because the distance gets increased, and so therefore it has to travel faster to complete that distance. Right. A bigger radius, a bigger circumference, so bigger speed is required. And when he pulls them on the ropes, he pulls it in, the sun comes up, the sun ri rises up a bit, comes up on a higher altitude. Then it's a shorter circumference, shorter radius, shorter circumference, so slower speed. Yes, so how does this affect the, the, pla the, 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 the planet, the climate, what's going to happen? When the sun, we know that we have the, what is it called the Sankranti, right? There's yes. Kark Sankranti and, uh, and the other, and, and, and Makara, Makara Sankranti, Makar Sankranti in January and Kark yes. Sankranti coming in July. So what happens with the Sankranti? What's that? Is it because of the change of the direction? Yes. So what's going to happen? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. As I understand, the vertical motion of the sun uh, creates seasons differently in different levels of the planetary systems. In the sense, like for, ex for example, uh, the sun rays, as we understand, reaches at its uh, lowest level, which is at the earthly planets. So there, when the sun is uh, rotating at the highest speed, so the seasonal changes that occurs is different when it is moving upwards towards the Guar Loka or the Swarga Loka. There, relatively, the sun is moving slower, and so the seasonal changes are different in duration. So even though it's all the circular motion, but if you can imagine when it is being vertically moved, the distance that is covered is different. And so the arc that it makes is different. And based on that, the seasonal changes are also different. So we need to understand that, uh, I mean, mathematically or geometrically, if we actually place this uh, model, we can easily understand how it actually works. Mm. Oh, okay. That's a different point from what I was talking about, though. Maharaj, can I say something, Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu. 
Yeah, this will, uh, you know, like when the, uh, it, it creates two ayanas. Means the air is divided into two. One is Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. From Makara Sankranti, uh, that is from Jan to Ju, uh, July, it, it travels towards north. Means uh, the, the um, uh, Dhruva is pulling the, uh, uh, pulling the ropes. So it's moving towards uh, north which is technically called as Uttarayana. Then he started loosening. Then uh, again, sun uh, tra uh, start traveling towards southern direction, which is called Dakshinayana. Yeah, and what's the effect on the days? Guru is it that the day and night start getting shorter? Right, yes, yes. Changing. Yeah. So, Makar, Makar Sankranti, it, the days start to become longer and the nights shorter, right? Because the sun Maharaj, is... Yes? At that time, the summer, the summer season starts during Makara Shankranti. That's right, yes. And the days start to become longer. And it's the summer season. And then when the sun is coming to the south, then the nights become longer and the days shorter. So coming into the winter, coming towards winter. Now, it's not that the sun is just moving vertically up and down, but it's, you know, there's, it, they, 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 they make a study of the motion of the earth and if you see the track on a, if you look every day, and over a year, you see that the motion of the sun is like a figure eight. So, it, it, because it's, it's not exact, it's not, the, the, it's not that the sun just moves up and down on a vertical plane, but it goes off to the side different ways. And so that's why you get different variations also, uh, will influence different planets. We heard also different demigods, they were how they influenced, some can cause uh, rainfall and some can cause cyclone even, different planets, right? Some have good influence, some have bad influence. Maharaj, can you please explain the motion of the sun, which is representing like a figure eight. So, if there is a rotation of the sun beginning from one point and then he makes a complete circumferential um, sort of rotation to come back to that point usually it's a circle on one direction but when we talk of an eight then there should be some opposite direction also there is a rotation so how is that actually forming a figure of eight i'm not able to but, understand well that. it's not a perfect eight but it's it it's not far away it's resembling that it's not it's definitely not the straight up and down as we would think. Yeah. So, you know, this is, uh, I, I, I saw when I was uh, browsing the internet, I came across something like that. There was a figure like that. I'll try to find it again for the next okay. class to, to show you. Okay. But there was something like that that I saw. And, and we see also, as you mentioned, you know, that, that we have the, the high, you know, according to the seasons, like in the summer, the sun will be high in the sky, and whereas in the winter, the sun will be lower. And if, if, if every day, if you go and, you know, take a picture of the sun, and you'll see how the height changes over a year, that in, in the heat of the, in the middle of the summer, the sun will be high in the sky. But at the same time, in the winter, the sun will be much lower in the sky. So different times of the year, the sun is changing its height there. Okay, so the... Uh, do we have another group We're going to talk about uh, the phases of the moon? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept our dandas pranas. Yeah. Uh, yeah, our, uh, our group is uh, talking about waxing and running moon, which is uh, discussed in chapter 22, 8 to 10 shlokas. 8 shloka is talking about the distance of the moon from the sun, 
And in ninth shloka, he's talking about the topic of waxing and running. In tenth shloka, he's talking about different potencies of the moon. Yeah. And in first eight shloka, he's telling about the distance. It's a hundred thousand yojanas from the sunlight, and it's moving faster than sun. He said, and uh, uh, translated to also told that it takes two lunar fortnights moon to travel toward the equivalent of summer of the sun. And it takes two and of uh, two quarter day passed to one month of the sun, and one day it passes to fourth night of sun. And Shila Prabhupada in his purport is telling, according to this distance, it is not possible for to reach the moon planet, uh, what the modern scientists are claiming. So he's saying uh, in Vedic calculation, they are more accurate. And in next uh, next shloka, he's talking about the waxing in many moon. Shubham. Okay, Hare Krishna. Okay, Mother Okay, Hare Krishna, Maharaj Dandrat Pranam. This uh, uh, slogan number nine says that when the moon is waxing, the illuminating portions of it increases daily, thus creating day for the demigods and night for the pitas. When the moon is waning, however, it causes night for the demigods and day for the pitas. In this way, the moon passes through each constellation of stars in 30 muhurtas and in their day. So this is about the waxing and waning of moon even here. Okay, so... And, and okay, according to the lunar calculations, two fortnights, one of the waxing moon and the other of the waning, form one month. Every month? Yeah. So, the waxing moon is favorable for the demigods. Yes, they, and the waning, they for the And the waning moon is for the uh, pitris. Demons. So, they share the moon planet? The demigods and the pitris, are they both there on the same planet? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, actually, Prabhupada, I was hearing somebody, uh, they were saying, we want to go to the moon planet, proper way to go, uh, either worship the devas or worship the pitris, <laughs> and you can go to the moon that way, by the... There, there. Maharaj, here, here I have small doubt, Maharaj. Yes. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord said, whoever prays Pitrus, they will go to Pitru. Loka said, whoever prays Devatas, they will go to their, their certain abodes. But he, there, Lord Krishna did say that moon is common thing, no, Maharaj? If we pray Pitru, Pitrus, they can go to moon land. That he didn't tell, no? If we pray to the Pitris, they can go to the moon? Yeah. Ah. What, they can go to the moon or we can go to the moon? No, no, whoever prays uh, Pitrus, through them we can go to moon, land, moon uh, planet that he has not mentioned it, no, in Bhagavad Gita, that's certain shloka. The worshippers of the Pitris, they go to the planet, they, they didn't say that that's a moon planet, you mean? Yes, my yeah. Yes, you're right. There may be another planet which is for the Pitris, which is not the moon. Thank you. It may be like that. Certainly they don't mention that that is the moon planet. But this... Hare Krishna Maharaj, in another slogan it is saying that Bhumo Rastristhada Krishna Shanvasa Dachinayanam Tatra Chandramasam Jyodhan Yogi Prapya Nivartade. That means if they are uh, uh, dying on Dachinayana time, they will go to moon planet and uh, then they will come back to the uh, earth planet when after their... Oh, if they leave the body in the dark, then they yeah, go... Yeah, Dachinayana time. Yeah, then they will go to moon planet and come back. Okay. Then they will go to, yeah, Uttarayanam, they will go to um, yeah, the uh, spiritual world and like that. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it's not, it's not that everybody can go to the spiritual world just because they leave the body in the daytime. <laughs> but that verse is there in the Bhagavad Gita, that's for the mystics. 
who practice mystic <coughs> yoga. Those who are, those is not for everyone, but for the properly qualified person. Okay, so the moon planet, uh, the waxing of the. Hare Krishna, Mother. Yes. Sorry for troubling you, Maharaj. I had just one more question, Maharaj, regarding this that they will go to Pitra Loka or they will go to moon planet. So, uh, is there someone coming to receive them or they go by themselves? <laughs> like we have Yam Dutas and we have Vishnu Dutas. Do we have Pitra Dutas? Well, there's arrangement. There is arrangement to transport them. There is arrangements there, yeah, there, it's the, mentioned there, that there are arrangements, there are personalities who have that responsibility. You know, just like, you know, you go somewhere, you know, the company would send somebody to pick you up from the airport or something or like that, you know. So, the same way, you know, it's very organized. You're going to go somewhere, some higher planet, it will be arranged. There will be persons there to take care, to transport you from one place to the other. You don't have to worry. It will all, it's all taken care of. They Thank have, you very much. They, they have very efficient management. <laughs> they have, that's why they have 33 crore demigods, you know. <laughs> they, have, they have a lot of uh, work, a big staff there, you know. But it's all arranged. Don't worry. Uh, all right. So, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. I have also have a question. Like this Pitra Loka is uh, above the Bhu, like Bhu, 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 Bhu or Swar, or it is below. If I remember correctly, we saw that Pitra Loka is down after the heaven, like down planet. It is Pitra Loka is after that. Patala somewhere over there, Pitra Loka, or it is up. Pitra Loka is up. So it is near the Swargaloka, somewhere close to that area, near the moon planet or? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't hear it mentioned. It's not one of the planets in the cosmic, you know, in the solar system. But, but there, there is somewhere Pitri Loka. And here we're learning that half of the moon is for the Pitris. The dark half, you know, it's, it's for the Pitris. So the Pitris and the Devas, they both reside on the moon planet. Is that maybe there's another place, there may be another planet which is specifically Pitri Loka. But certainly from the, the, the implication from this section, uh, the, the, uh, the Pitris are residing on the moon. That's something, that's a, a good question to ask somebody, somebody who knows a bit more, you know, the, who's gone into this a bit more. These are, I have many questions that you know to make make a note of. When I get a hold of the right person, I'll try to run them off <laughs> and find out everything. But it's not a very clear topic, and it's everything is not so clear just from reading the Srimad Bhagavatam. You really have to read a lot of other things, scriptures. You know, like people often quote Surya Siddhanta. That's one of the books which they sometimes quote. And then also that book by that, that book by the, the, the commentary by the Madhva Saint, what's his name? Again, Vajaraj, Vajaraj Tirtha or something? Vadiraj Tirtha. Vadiraj Tirtha, yes, right. He wrote a famous book and he spoke of, it's all about Bhumandala and the different planets in the universe and everything and the, the movements of the planets. So there are many other references involved. All right, what about the group working on eclipses? Did you, were you able to come up with something? We didn't really cover much on eclipse. I didn't speak much on it because I'm not too clear on it myself. Do you have some? Yes, we just discussed about how the eclipses occur. 
actually the rogu when rogu actually have a enmity it's having enmity towards the sun and the moon so it wants to hide the light of the sun so the sun and the moon planet when it is actually um, asking protection from lord vishnu then lord vishnu sent his sudarshana chakra and the sudarshana chakra is actually helping the sun and the moon planet so actually when it is actually tries to cover the light of the sun that period is known as eclipse solar eclipse and lunar eclipse and uh, it won't stand actually much time i don't know whether one muhurta the maximum time it can stand in front of the sun and moon the rahu stands in between sun and the moon is maximum one muhurta or 48 minutes that's it. the details yeah we didn't discuss much about this there was an eclipse just the other day but it was only visible in north america and canada and north china and russia but it's like an annual an a- annual eclipse the ecl- eclipses are quite regular every year there's certain times there's a- these eclipses which take place yes. now there are two planets rahu is one and then there's also ketu So the the inform do you know anything about this Maharaji do you know about Ketu and what's the difference um like when there was a churning time purma uh, avatar when there was when danvantri actually brought the nectar and when he was actually distributing mohini avatar this first time during that first time when they are distributing nectar to the demigods that time uh, rahu actually came in between the sun and the moon they were gods and he actually he disguised himself he went actually in between the sun and the moon so by the curse of a lord vishnu they become ragu and ketu i'm not sure maharaj i think yeah there there it there seems there some different versions on this as you, me- you you mentioned that the one person became rahu and ketu but the 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 way i heard it narrated was that ketu was another person and ketu had actually drank the nectar also and he drank the nectar and when he was revealed that he was a demon then mohini also decapitated you know used the sudarshan chakra to decapitate him but because he drank the nectar his body didn't die but did no nectar left in the head <laughs> so he had a body he had a he had a, a live body without a head okay so there was rahu with a head and no body and ketu had a body and no head so the demigods met they just say have to do something have to give them a prop because they're they're they've got this they've got the they've drank the nectar so they don't die they're immortal so they put the snake body on the on the head of rahu and they put a snake head for ketu so they they actually i saw a picture of a like almost like deities brass forms you know one with the snake head and one was a snake body <laughs> so rahu and ketu so the two of them are there what is the material you the current you non devotees how do they understand eclipses because they don't consider any they don't believe in any rahu or ketu so what is their thinking when an eclipse takes place what's happening Hare Krishna Maharaj uh, when earth comes in between a sun and moon then the shadow of earth will come in the sun and that is the straight line so and uh, comes straight line then the shadow will come on the moon, uh, sun and that is the uh, solar eclipse and uh, uh, when moon comes in between a uh, sun uh, uh, like that it's uh, and uh, earth and uh, um, uh, sun then uh, that moon uh, in the at night Uh, we will see the shadow of earth in the moon and that is um uh, so lunar eclipse 
Okay. So th they say like that. that it's, there's just the, the, yes. the earth coming in, in between the, the sun and the moon, or the moon becoming coming in between the earth and the sun. That must be in, in the daytime, right? When the moon comes. Yeah. Solar eclipse in day and lunar eclipse in night. Yes. But we say, of course, we say that there's these invisible planets which come and cover the sun or cover the moon. Whatever the case may be, you have the lunar eclipse or the solar eclipse. Manraj, from the Bhagatam point of view, there is never a chance that the earth can come between sun and moon because it's totally in a different plane. So the idea of Rahu, who is below the sun and the moon, as explained in the these chapters, is more uh, reasonable to understand. And it is said that it is invisible. So it's, uh, it's rotating uh, along with the sun. And that's the reason why it wouldn't allow the sun rays to come on a particular part of the earth. So when he covers onto the sun, when he attacks on the sun, you find the solar eclipse. And when he attacks onto the moon, you find the lunar eclipse. Because moon is much higher vertically than the sun. And so he rotates, the, the Rahu rotates at different speeds during the period of time. And also, as being explained in the Bhagavatam, that uh, the, the area or, or his uh, uh, luminance or his influence is much wider than that of the sun and the moon. So is it always Rahu responsible for the eclipses? Is not Ketu sometimes? Uh, well, in the Bhagavatam, it only speaks about the Rahu, it doesn't speak much about the Ketu. So, I probably understood in this way that the bodies of Rahu and Ketu are actually merged. Even though we see physically that the Rahu and Ketu, as uh, mentioned even in the Goloka chart, are two different planets. But because they, they work in tandem, and that's why you find that the influences are like that. Oh. Yes, there's certainly, you don't find any mention there in Ketu in the, in the Bhagavatam. Because the concept of the modern day scientists which says that the earth comes between sun and moon is uh, really incomprehensible from the viewpoint of Bhagavatam because that's totally in a different plane and a different level. The sun doesn't, sun is not, the, the earth is not part of the luminaries, whereas the moon, sun and the Rahu are part of the luminaries who are actually rotating. So, this concept is a little, you know, not very clear from the modern-day scientific ways. Oh. Maharaj? Yes? Can I say something, Maharaj? Please. Maharaj, according to Surya Siddhanta, uh, Ketu causes Chandra Grahan, that is lunar eclipse, and uh, Rahu causes uh, solar eclipse. Uh, yes, yeah, that's the way I heard it explained today when I was surfing on the net. Someone said like that. That's Surya Siddhanta, is it? Yes, Maharaj. Uh -huh. And of course, because since uh, uh, divine, His Divine Grace, uh, uh, Bharti Siddhan Saraswati has written on it, so, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can, we can accept it as an authentic scripture, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Surya Siddhanta. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Very interesting. Maharaj, one more thing, Maharaj, uh, when you are talking about uh, seasons, uh, you, you are mentioning, you know, if on one particular day, uh, if we observe the sunrise on different months, uh, we will come in the form of eight. Uh, can I save that image, Maharaj? Can you save that image? Can I, can I share that image? Yes. Do you have it with you? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, very good. Maharaj? Oh, yeah. This is when you are looking at Maharaj? Yes, I can see, yeah. Yeah, so this is during uh, uh, December, then it starts progressing January, February, March, then again it starts decreasing. Uh -huh. This is a real time picture, Maharaj. 
This is a what picture? Real time means uh, you know it, it's it's real time picture. You know every month you know uh, somebody has taken it and they have captured it. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice. Can I close it, Maharaj? Yes. Prabhu, from the same spot. Everything yeah. from the same spot. From the same spot and the same same timing almost. Hmm? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has to be same spot, same time, and the change yeah. in the sun. Right. That's right. That's how it happens. Yeah. Can, can I close my right? Yes. Please. Uh, Jai Gautru, I've just shared one uh, uh, website link you can check there and i think probably maharaj was looking at that shape of the eight which is there you can probably access that and share it yes yeah, so i'll have to look for it <laughs> uh, so many things there and it's certainly very absorbing to think about these things you know we never we we experience them every day. Oh, yeah, there it is. That's it, that middle one. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm. Yeah. You can zoom that, Professor. I'll save this image, then I'll zoom in. You have saved this image, Prabhu? I will make you co-host, you, you share it, Prabhu, because it's, okay, now it's saving, now hang on. Yeah, you, we can we can we can understand now. You know, it's such a complex subject matter. We can appreciate why Srila Prabhupada said that you are so many PhDs. <laughs> so he wanted them to use their PhD education to develop the plan for the temple of the Vedic planetarium and to show all these things in a manner which will make it acceptable for the public. So we're all looking forward to that day when we can open up our temple of the Vedic planetarium and we can spend some valuable time to go through and to see all these displays and to see for ourselves exactly what's being told here in the Bhagavatam, to see it all presented. Jai. So this is the same thing, right? The, 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 the same time every day. Would it be, would it be like that? To, t to take this picture? Krishna Prabhu? Uh, yes, Prabhuji, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very uh, sure on that because uh, I really do not know. Because if we, if we take any one particular point and go in one direction, then after a point of time there should be a reverse motion. If I start from here, I go there and then I actually come back. So there should be a reverse motion also. So we are not seeing this, such kind of a reverse motion explained in the Bhagavatam. So how does that actually work through is not... Um, clearly comprehensible. No, it's circular. It's, it's going round, right? It's a continual motion, going up, rising and descending, going up and going round. It's, conti it's a continual motion, could begin and end anywhere. Yeah, but what, what I mean to say is that, like, it's, it's not like a circular motion. It's like if you go from one direction, you go all the way up and then again after a point of time you have to turn back 
Well, that's, that's what's happening, right? It's going up and then it's coming back, and then going up and then coming back. The figure eight. Yeah. It's just coming back in a different route to make that, and that's yeah. how the figure eight appears. Yeah. It could be, Maharaj, I mean, this is just my uh, understanding. As what we get, uh, get, get to see from the explanations of Bhagavatam, wherein we are talking of the ayanas, which is like from north to south and again south to north, going up. So that explains this type of emotion in the sense like from north to south when it is coming, it's in a particular direction. And when it goes from south to north to that previous direction, it, it is on the opposite side. <clears throat> so from that perspective, I'm trying to say that there should be an opposite motion. So, anyway, the modern scientists also have their own ways of explanation, but their explanation is always uh, with uh, keeping the sun as the center and everything else is rotating around. So whereas the Bhagavatam concept is totally different. So to match these two are definitely something that is required to be on a higher dimension. Okay. <laughs> It's maybe because of the one wheel, we can have this motion. What? Because of one wheel? Yeah, he's got only one wheel, Maharaj. So when he's moving, he's taking a turn and coming back, you know, some some kind of frequency. It's very difficult, Maharaj. <laughs> That's an interesting theory. Being on one wheel couldn't turn around. So, being on one wheel made made it easier or made it more difficult for him to turn. But it, it's connected with the rope which we spoke. It's the air air balloon which we so air pockets which we are talking about. Maybe because of the movement of the speed, you know, it, it looks like it's, it's taking a turn curve <laughs> and only one wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you have to call Suranayan personally and speak to him. How is it working? Certainly, the more we look into the universe, the more we become amazed at the complexity of the design. The, the amazing arrangements which are there within this universe for the maintenance of everything. the system, the different systems which are all there and the provisions for all different types of people, all different forms of living entities. Just like we learned in the beginning, you know, that it's just so complex that Sukadeva Goswami said, he said, I can only tell you what I know, there's so much that even if you live for a lifetime of Brahma, You'll never know everything of this of this this tiny universe. Okay, so I guess we'll stop here tonight and we'll meet on Tuesday and we'll go on to the subterranean heavenly planets. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Maharaj, you want to... Maharaj, can I have a question, Maharaj? Yes, please. Uh, Maharaj, uh, as you mentioned, you know, this uh, particular section was explained by Shukadeva Goswami for the yogis, for the non-devotees, basically. Right. Uh, after listening to this episode, uh, did they all become devotees, Maharaj? <laughs> hmm. Well, they were certainly blessed to sit and hear Srimad Bhagavatam from Sukadeva Goswami. Interesting point, you know, that, that he's catering for them. There's, by speaking on this topic, he's, provi he's, he's providing something, food for them, to encourage them to, to get their interest. And so it's important. And speaking, you want to present, we want to be able to present something for the audience. So he was aware of the audience, so he spoke on this um, universal form, this Sishumara 
form just to attract the minds of these yogis that they will take more interest. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Um, thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, it's also a fact that actually the formation of the entire stars in the sky is in the form of a dolphin. It's arranged it in, in the form of a dolphin. So a, a yogi who is actually meditating, he is also meditating on the form of the Lord. For just uh, those who are advanced, they meditate on the form of the Vishnu. Otherwise, those who are not, they, they meditate upon the universal forms. And this is a tangible universal form which they can actually see physically also. So because of that arrangement, this uh, particular topic is explained. Is what is my understanding, Maharaj? Is that uh, it, it's, because is the form still still visible now, or was it only in the past it was visible? Maharaj, as we understand, this definitely it's visible even today. Just like, for example, if we talk of the Saptarishi Mandala, we say it's it's in it's in a particular formation. So if we observe in the sky, we can actually see this formation, and uh, uh, those who are very good in astronomy are able to connect these points and mark and tell us how it looks like. So it's a tangible physical model which is existing. So we can see the Saptarishi Mandala, but we cannot see the Swarga Loka. <clears throat> so that's because within the universe, <clears throat> there are different uh, levels of filters, which is not possible for us to see. And uh, so uh, the Shishumara planets also uh, the Shishumara planetary system also with all the different uh, stars which has been actually explained and uh, which is moving around the, the Dhruva Loka in, in, in that particular form is actually a physical model which exists. So based on the meditation one can actually locate and physically place those stars and then he should be able to see this form. That's what actually this it means. Yeah. Yeah, certainly a very, very feas feasible presentation of the object of meditation. I, I think it's more easy to conceive of this kind of meditation than it is, than it was in the second canto. The, yeah. med the meditation in the second canto is more difficult than the, the one which is presented here. True. Everything is very exact, you know, all the different parts of the body and the different planets, which planet is where, and very nice. And it's, and it's very interesting actually to say that on the, on the surface of the Shishumara formation, there are only luminaries. There are no stationary objects. They're all stars or those luminary planets which are there. Uh, so that's what is actually set into motion. And that's another interesting feature there, which makes it uh, more tangible for the uh, yogis because they also want to become like shining stars. One of their objectives is like they want to remain eternally. So for them, they look for this type of uh, arrangement. No. <laughs> so their goal, their goal is to become a star. Yeah. There are, because they, they find that the, the stars are eternally shining in the sky and they have such kind of a goals for such people. This is explained. Oh, okay. Well, we, I knew the people who died on the battlefield, the, the great Kshatriyas died in the battlefield. They could also, they'd be given a chariot and they, they become like a star almost. That You can't distinguish them from stars when they go, unless you go into the higher planets. And from here, Sometimes the, the, these great warriors in their chariots, they appear to be stars, but actually they're great warriors moving on chariots. So that's uh, some, because the this, this, this sky is so full of stars, so, so full of so many different things. Some of them are celestial stars and others are just great warriors in their chariots and they're moving around going from one place to another sometimes they attend a meeting with indra sometimes go to some other planet but they have very effulgent chariots arjuna saw them 
When Arjuna went to heaven, he saw all of these people who had been killed on the battlefield, and how they were all in chariots driving around in their subtle bodies. Heavenly planets will be subtle. One, one, of, one of the examples about uh, proving, you know, trying to establish the, the principle that, that there's a subtle existence above everything. They give the example about gold. They say gold is jada, that is just dull matter here in this world. But in the spiritual world, gold is chintamani. It has full consciousness. Everything has consciousness in the spiritual world. So it is Krishna's, it Krishna's abode, you know. So the gold there is all like chintamani and it has consciousness. But gold in the heavenly planets, is, it's not fully spiritual and it's not fully material. It's in between the two. It is subtle. And they give the example, just like people worship demigods, sometimes these demigods, if they want, they can appear to their devotees. And when they appear, they will come dressed in all their ornaments. And often they're decorated with golden ornaments and so on. So they appear with the gold and they disappear with the gold also. They're, they're, all their ornaments also go with them. It's not like the ornaments are different from them. The ornaments also have that subtle potency. Just like the bodies of the celestial beings, the higher planets, the demigods, they're subtle. And so all their ornaments are also of the same nature. <laughs> it's inconceivable. But this is what we're this is what we're looking at in the Bhagavatam. We're we're learning about the inconceivable beyond the powers of our mind and senses. We're poor little Kali Yuga beings. We we can hardly understand anything. What do we know? But in other ages people could understand these things. They could go there, they could experience these things. We hear about them and we just think, is it possible? Is it, could it really be? But it's possible. Okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki Jai.